Welcome to episode number 199 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcasting podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. We're recording live on YouTube on Friday, August 25th, 2017. A handful of things to talk about. We're in a short week because we... Uh, we broadcast last Monday, so um, we're, uh, <laughs> we're working on a short week, but we do have things to talk about. The favorite this tweet, LinkedIn video, linking in video, how to resign, deep emoji, Trump speed, Siri gets married, KFC VR, let them eat cake, brand tags, and much, much more. Yale, you always have the honor kick it off with the best story of the week. What was it? Well, I just love the fact that Obama's Char Charlottesville response tweet broke the record for the most liked tweet ever. And this is from an AV News story by Katie Reif. And, you know, here's some news that could potentially hold the key to Donald Trump's complete and irreversible mental breakdown. Um, Barack Obama and... Uh, he just tweeted something from Nelson Mandela that says no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or the background of his religion. And it has now broken the record for the most liked tweet of all times with 4.5 million retweets and many more likes. And he tweeted that a few hours after President Trump's half-assed criticism of both sides and almost two days before someone forced him to condemn racist violence and three days before he let us know how he really felt and um so it was wonderful to see that and um you know what can i say every once in a while we see something from someone that we really love and respect and it makes us feel better well that one evoked a lot of the uh, a lot of emotions right uh people responding with uh with uh, emotional responses to that favoritist tweet um but emotion is often a tricky thing on social media, especially when we're talking about uh, social listening. A lot of the social listening tools have, for a long time, had a difficult uh, time detecting uh, detecting sarcasm, for instance, for, for instance, or irony. They can't really understand that, so uh, they're they're hit and miss. Um, but there are some research who have apparently come up with an algorithm that can detect sarcasm on Twitter. This is from an MIT technology review uh, story by Will Knight. So uh, the algorithm MIT researchers developed to analyze tweets can now detect sarcasm, they claim, uh, and emotional subtext in general better than most people. Uh, more accurate, it more accurately discerns the meaning of tweets and comments uh, and by doing so, this could help computers automatically spot and quash uh, abuse and hate speech, for example, um, as machines become smarter, uh, being able to accurately uh, detect emotion, sarcasm, and so forth. Uh, having a sense of emotion will help uh, better uh, humans connect, uh, communicate with the machines and vice versa. So uh, it does have lots of applica obvious applications. Um, by getting this right, so research originally uh, researchers originally aimed to develop a system that was detect that was capable of detecting racist posts on Twitter, uh, but they soon realized that the meaning of many messages couldn't be properly understood without uh, some understanding of sarcasm. The secret to training this algorithm was that uh, many tweets already use a labeling system uh, for emotional content content and something we commonly call the emoji. Uh, so they took advantage of this uh, to help the system read tweets for emotions in general. Uh, they uh, had a head start because they they harnessed the power of the emojis in detecting emotion. Uh, so the neural network learned the connection between a certain kind of language and an emoji. They're calling the algorithm deep emoji because they use deep learning to detect uh, the emo the, the uh, emotions associated with the emojis. So the researchers collected five, 55 billion tweets. They selected 1.2 billion containing some combination of 64 popular emoji. First, they trained the system to predict which emoji would be used uh, with a particular message, depending on whether it was happy, sad, humorous, and so on. 
then the system was taught to identify sarcasm using an existing data set of labeled examples. Uh, the algorithm had that had uh, been pre-trained using emojis was far better at detecting sarcasm than the one that had, hadn't. They also tested it against humans uh, using volunteers they, uh, they um, uh, uh, got through Mechanical Turk, uh, and they found that it was better than the humans at spotting sarcasm and other emotions. It was 82% uh, accurate at identifying sarcasm when compared to the average score of 76% for human volunteers. So they're going to release the algorithm for anyone to use. You can try it out at deepemoji.mit.edu, and you can even contribute to the re research by letting it access your three most uh, recent tweets, and then you explain what emotion you felt when you were writing those tweets. I like that a lot. You know, yeah. that's something that, that everybody's been after for a really long time, but I'm still waiting for the algorithm that's going to know what to make of, I really love you fucking guys. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, uh, speaking of ways to communicate, the latest resignation letter spent, sent to President Trump spells out the word impeach in initial caps in all the paragraphs. And it was from Daniel Cam Kamen, uh, and he's an energy professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and he resigned Wednesday from his position as State's Department Science Envoy, something he had done for more than 20 years. He was appointed to the position back in February 2016. He had all these different federal roles for 20 years, and his decision was tied to President Trump's, quote, attack on the core values of the United States. Initial caps on his resignation letter, which we'll include in the show notes, spell out the word impeach. Very good letter. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't think that that would have been called subtle uh, year, you know, before this administration. But I think that's something that everybody's looking for these days. So, uh, so maybe not so subtle. But You're anyway. looking for people to take a stand. You mean? Yeah. 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 Well, he certainly did, and and you know, we're still waiting for other people in the government to do the same. So um, LinkedIn has been. Uh, Dipping their toes ever gingerly in the in the video waters, uh, they've had the Q and A function for influencers to uh, to answer questions via video, and uh, they're starting to roll out uh, actual native uploading of video now. This is from a uh, Mashable article by by Molly Sequin and uh, LinkedIn post by one of the engineers there, Peter Davies. Um, so LinkedIn's rolling out video upload capability now, and you can do it through iOS and, and the Android app, not for the web yet, but uh, I imagine that would be coming. Uh, fe the feature is only available for frequent contributors at the moment, but will be available to everyone else soon by frequent contributors, I assume people that post a lot of, uh, of blog posts on, on LinkedIn because uh, the video upload obviously is not widely available yet. Um, but once you upload the video, then you can see audience insights such as the top companies that viewed the video, the titles of people, lo their locations of your viewers, uh, as well as how many views, likes, and comments your videos are receiving. Um, so, you know, better late than never, I guess. But uh, but look for video soon to come to uh, your mobile your, your mobile LinkedIn app. Welcome to the party, LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we don't really want this to be in. Uh, all Trump broadcast, but this one's too good to pass up. There's a bot that shows you just exactly what Trump sees when he opens his Twitter feed. And this is from a Washington Post story by Philip Bump. And the feed is called at Trump's underline feed. And and whenever he opens his Twitter app, it, it shows his view of the world. It can be tricky to know what someone else sees when they fire up their application, uh, Bump said in this article, and everybody follows a different group of people, and that colors the information that they receive. So toward that end, they created this account that checks who Trump follows every five minutes and then retweets any tweets from them over that period. And the net result of that is a replication of what Trump would see on those occasions when he switches from the mentions tab. And much of what Trump learns about the world is filtered through two lenses, 
what he watches on cable news, particularly Fox, and what he sees on Twitter. And I, for one, was hoping that after he looked directly at the sun during the solar eclipse, he would damage his eyes and not be able to tweet anymore, but alas, that has not happened. So um, Wired Ash Wired's Ashley Feinberg linked the arguments from Trump's Tuesday news conference about the violence in Charlottesville last weekend to rhetoric that he may have picked up from Twitter or watching Fox, and then uh, the liberal site Media Matters put a fine point on that connection, and they paired Trump's language with similar statements that had previously aired on Fox. It, all in all, it was quite a uh, startling bunch of information. <laughs> so is the feed real time? Yeah. That, you know what would be really fascinating? I think that's actually a very valuable a public yeah. service, basically. In the end um, effect, yeah. It would be it would be fascinating to have three screens up, one in the morning with Fox and Friends on TV in real time, uh, another with the morning of that bot with the feed of that bot, and uh, and um, another with the feed of the Trump camp Trump's Trump's feed to see what he res what he responds to and just watch all that happen in real time. It's all see, pretty predictable, you know. He he tweets at certain times every day. So yeah. you're right. If you had those screens up, you would see like clearly what he was gonna be writing about. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have any more best if you get another one. Oh I it. do. Um Apple is melding Siri with all its other services, and I think you have something about this in Worst, but um, this is from a Fast Company article by Mark Sullivan, and they're, what they're doing is they're basically positioning Siri as a concierge for all the company's devices and services. There's this whole land grab going on where all the assistants are trying to control as many parts of our digital lives as they can. So like Siri, Google and Amazon's assistants can access and manage messaging, email, calendars, uh, control our connected home, play music, perform web searches. So now Siri's going to be able to do all of those things as well. And well, I, I personally don't really want that much of a relationship with Siri. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I actually took it out of uh, out of worse, but I'll provide my my commentary here. Um, mine was like, wait, what? Wasn't Apple supposed to be the protector of our privacy? <laughs> by, melding, by by marrying Siri to everything else, I mean, you're going to have all the data of what you do uh, being collected by Apple. And by the way, Siri is not nearly as good as uh, the other voice actors. Well, oh, she's getting uh, better. She's getting better. They're but improving still her. Behind. Not, not okay. Good. Well, I don't want any of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, Google Maps has now let um, people post questions and answers on business pages it's from an Adweek story by Brandy Shaw. And uh, Google is rolling out a new feature on Google Maps. I've got it already. And it allows uh, users to post answers post and answer questions on business sites. It's kind of like Quora with maps and business hours. And you can find a section on, on business listings where you can post questions, answer questions by other users, and read and upvote questions and answers that have already been shared. And the ones that receive upvotes appear at the top of the business question and answer section. And when a user asks a question, Google notifies the business owner and other, I don't know what this means, in the no users to see if they can answer it. And users are then notified when their question gets a response. So businesses can now also share uh, frequently asked questions and answers on their business listings. And it's rolling out now to Google Maps users on Android and mobile search users worldwide, although I already have it on my desktop. Yeah, I think that's a plus or minus for it's it's a it's a pro and a con for businesses. Well, there's so much that's, you have to follow to keep right. up with it. So yeah. if you need to, one, it's a good opportunity to engage in, in potential customers immediately in real time, right? So it's an opportunity in that sense. But two, it's also a drag on your resources. you got to have somebody paying attention to that. Yet and, another uh, thing to monitor. Immediately and, and dealing with that. So, uh, so yes and no. Unless, remember we did talk about the bot, the bot um, that was built into my business function that is being built into my business function for Google My Business. Uh, if all those questions, all those answers to questions turn into an automated system, then, you know. That's Everything seems here. to be going in that direction, so maybe, you know. So that brings us to the worst uh, news of the week, right? Dave, you want to start? 
It does indeed, and this is the worst. This is a political story by uh, Lewis Nelson, who discusses a Louise Linton, who is an actress who I had never heard of before, but uh, apparently she's been in some movies, but kind of a B-lister or maybe a C-lister actress anyway. she uh, her, her, her biggest claim to fame is uh, she is the wife of Te Treasury Secretary uh, Steven Mnuchin, and uh, she had to apologize this past week for ranting on Instagram in response to a commenter. Um, she responded condescendingly, very condescendingly to uh, one Jennifer Miller, uh, who had commented on one of her Instagram photos in which um, Linton and Mnuchin appeared to be disembarking from a government plane uh, Painted in the same style as Air Force One, by the way, and in her caption to uh, to her photo of her of her deplaning, uh, Linton wrote that the couple had enjoyed a great day trip to Kentucky, and then added hashtags for all the brands that she was wearing including Roland Moray, a French fashion designer, a Hermes scarf, a Tom Ford glasses, Valentino. Uh, Jennifer Miller responded, glad we could pay for your little getaway, hashtag deplorable, to which Linton went on a rant. Now get seated because this is a bit of a long rant. I'm going to read it. Ah, do you think that was a personal trip? Adorable. Do you think that U.S. government paid for our honeymoon or personal travel? LOLOL. Have you given more to the economy than me and my husband, either as an individual earner in taxes or in self-sacrifice to our country? I'm pretty sure we paid more taxes toward our day trip than you did. Pretty sure the amount we sacrifice per year is a lot more than you'd be willing to sacrifice if the choice was yours. You're adorably out of touch. Thanks for the, your, the passive aggressive nasty comment. Your kids look very cute. Your life looks cute. I know you're mad, but deep down you're really nice and so am I. Sending me passive aggressive Instagram comments isn't going to make life feel better. Maybe a nice uh, message, which I think she meant massage. One filled, oh, not, well, maybe a nice message, one filled with wisdom and humanity would get more traction. Have a pleasant evening. Go chill and watch the new Game of Thrones. It's fab. Linton's post was later deleted. Uh, her account was made private. Uh, but Jennifer Miller's got her 15 minutes of, of, of fame. So uh, she responded in a post on CNN.com. Uh, and she responded saying she, uh, she, referring to Linton, chose to respond in a way that only clarified her privilege by extolling her wealth and position. She said, I was out of touch, which I find incredibly laughable. I don't think she has any idea what everyday Americans deal with, especially when it comes to economic struggles. Since her husband is a secretary of the treasury, it behooves her to find out. Um, Americans are hurting, some even dying, as they struggle with racism, poverty, and healthcare costs. And yet, the wealthy Lyndon def Lin Linton defends her po her uh, boasting and derides me, a hardworking, taxpaying American, in the process. Her husband serves in the executive branch of her government. At the very least, he she owes the American people the appearance of compassion and, to use her own words, humanity. Washington Post article by Robin Give Givehan. Uh, made this point, and I think it kind of sums it up. She made the sneering, she, Linton, made the sneering suggestion that a person's income is the best measure of their value and stature, which is to suggest that the millions of dollars Mnuchin made in banking and hedge funding reflect his actual w cultural and societal value rather than the nature of the capitalist economy, an economy that typically undervalues teachers, mothers, and some healthcare aides, daycare providers, etc. Uh, Linton implied that becoming Treasury Secretary, Secretary for the world's largest economy was a breathtaking sacrifice in service of his country, and I guess she took a blow for the nation by marrying one. Surely it has challenges, but part of sacrificing in the name of patriotism is not talking about how much you're sacrificing in the name of patriotism. In a single Instagram post, Linton managed to tap into elitism, narcissism, self-righteousness, incivility, apathy, apathy and and blonde privilege all wrapped up in a designer package. So brands distanced, distanced themselves from Linton, of course. 
Uh, this is from a WWD article by Kaylee Hayes. A Valentino spokesman said uh, uh, that Linton, Luis Linton did not receive any gifted merchandise, compensation, or loans from Valentino. Tom Ford uh, also indicated they uh, it was not affiliated in any way uh, and that Linton had received no, no free merchandise from them. So a modern-day Marie Antoinette proclaiming, let them eat cake, right? And what came out later was where they went on that trip was they went, they used that plane to go see the eclipse. That's right. Yep. The yep. government plane, they used to go a, see the eclipse. Somebody's put a FOIA request for the uh, documents regarding that, too. So Un freaking believable. So, um, you know, we all know that, that uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality are in our future and in many ways are here. And so KFC uh, got involved with a VR training video that's really just the stuff of nightmares. Um, I, I uh, saw this because of Robert Scoble, and it was from VR Scout via Scoble. And then there was another story by um, Whitney Falloon. And uh, the case, what happened was, in case it's not hard enough being an employee of a fast food company, they're now making their workers go through this totally bizarre virtual reality game. It's, it's a creepy Bioshock type video. We, it's, in a, it's in a virtual reality escape room and it has narration from this omnipresent Colonel Sanders and he's like up in the ceiling and speaking down to you in this booming voice and it looks creepy AF. I mean, basically, we will put the video on the show notes, but oh my God, it's outrageous. I mean, you would just, and you can't escape because you have to stay there. And they claim that it's faster than training people in person because it's like 10 minutes, which were interminable. I didn't get through the whole thing, as opposed to it takes them 20 minutes in person. But I mean, oh, I feel so bad for everybody who has to go through that because it's horrible. So do employees need to like use uh, um, Google Cardboard to view it or do they have to, are they hired and then they have to go watch it through? Headsets, they give them headsets. And, and so they, I almost want to apply to KFC just to try it out. You could see it on the internet, you don't have to. And they, and they have like um, chicken fryers and, and uh, oh, it's just awful. <laughs> it's horrible. You have another one? I don't. Well, I um, really don't like a lot of the things that Facebook's done lately, and this one I dislike intensely. They've given influence the influencers the ability to tag brands in their posts. This is from a DigiDay story, and basically they're allowing brands, after the brands have been tagged in a post, they're allowing the brands to independently boost those posts with paid advertising. And I agree with Mark Britton, who said, uh, if a brand wants an influencer-sponsored post to be seen at scale, it will need to support it with paid media or no scale. So this is eventually going to render an influencer's audience useless, just like a brand's owned audience has been useless for some time, he said. So no longer will Kim Kardashian get $500,000 for a sponsored skinny tee post in the old model, a brand that would get her endorsement and a massive audience in one fell swoop, that won't happen anymore. So like posts from brands on Facebook have long been pay to play. Now posts for influencers are the same and influencer marketing is never gonna be the same. I think it's a good idea. Why? <laughs> How do you think that? Idea. Because as if, if you're trying to, if you're an advertiser or some or brand and you're trying to do influencer marketing, you have no idea what, what you bought unless it's measured and, and you have to trust the influencer to give you the metrics that are, you know, you don't know. So uh, it's a measurement thing. I think it's also good for Facebook because clearly, so obviously Facebook is getting into it because there's money to be made. That's there. the only reason Facebook gets into anything, Dave. But it's also a way for them to control it. So if it gets out of hand, they can ratchet and they can adjust their algorithm to, um, to um, uh, you know, I mean, Facebook, Facebook, what has Facebook has done through by being, um, by not falling out of favor with users is uh, they've they know the limits. Everybody complains when there's a new Facebook feature and everything, but they don't leave. And uh, and so because they know what's going on, they have the ability to to measure that. And 
Well, I read a study this week that said that kids uh, are absolutely not using Facebook, and the reason they're not using it is because they're using Snapchat and and Instagram, but because their parents and grandparents are on it, and they feel like it's for old people, that's us, and they don't want to be there. Yeah. So that's face can true. Facebook continue this enormous growth that it's been in, not without new users, and yeah. all these ads, You, the kids don't care about this stuff. Yeah, they don't care still, about the kids ads. Are still using Facebook. They're still in using much Facebook. lower number. No, 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 they're using Facebook. It's called Instagram. Well, okay, Facebook owns Instagram, but they're also using Snapchat, and they don't want to be on Facebook. And that is going to ultimately take a toll on the advertising revenue. It will, Dave. You'll see. I'll be right. All right. We'll find <laughs> out. Mark your mark. Mark our words. Yeah. Remind so, us, dear listeners, who wins. <laughs> yeah. Right. It'll be me. It'll be me. Okay. So that brings us to shiny new objects. So why don't you give us one? <laughs> yeah, I got one, and this is very cool. Uh, Giphy. G-I-P-H-Y, the place you go to for uh, for animated GIFs, uh, has a cool little tool uh, called the GIF Maker. They also have a GIF Editor, but this is a GIF Maker, and uh, it's very simple to use. Uh, you can take a video, a uh, YouTube or a Vimeo video, and uh, plug it in and extract a segment of it to create a GIF out of. So if you have uh, post you're writing that you want to express a certain emotion with the GIF and you know the perfect scene from the movie that you love that will express that emotion uh, but you can't find it on YouTube or whatever uh, you can uh, or you can't find a GIF of it you can use this this to uh, take the clip from from YouTube and create a GIF a three second GIF out of it so you just plug in the URL for the video uh, position it to the section you want to create the GIF out of add a caption if you want and then save, and it saves uh, saves a nice little gif out of that. And I'll give you an example. I did an example from Prince's uh, bat dance video that we'll <laughs> include in the show notes. Oh, I love Giphy. That's one of my favorite toys. Yeah. So I um, was uh, uh, shown a an app called Readability, and it's a natural language processing tool that scores content for business writers and subject matter experts and makes suggestions for improvements. And there are a lot of tools like this one, but this one searches out poorly written, lengthy, hard to understand content, literally across hundreds of pages of uh, web pages or documents and audits for the issues that drive away visitors who are looking for information. And it's the new but underlying technology used by seven of the largest government contractors to improve the contract language and compliance and because they're mandated by the plain language act and they uh, absolutely have a huge workload and this can take 80 percent of the workload off of the writers and then send them back what they need to edit which is very interesting but they now have a free version called readability and it's free for personal use and it'll do five um, documents or websites per month uh, with unlimited text so it could be a thousand pages if that were necessary or an entire website you know all the pages on a website and it will give you a readability score and 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 point out uh, unreadable content which I think is very helpful very good very good uh, definitely needed for lang the contract language too <laughs> oh my god absolutely yeah. and for you know for just most of the things that most people write. <laughs> right, exactly. Sure. I mean, writing clearly is one of the hardest things there is. You know, people write uh, in, there's just so many more words than they need to have. And, and, and I think like cutting down to the barest minimum number of words yeah. is probably the hardest thing that writers do, you know. And yeah. I, I once had the pleasure of working with a New Yorker editor in one of the agencies I worked at. And he would come and he would edit our copy. And your whole page would just be like marked up, you know. But his exercise was that you had to keep removing words from your sentence until it changed the meaning of the sentence so that you had the barest possible number of words to express a thought. And it's a really hard exercise, but it taught me so much about how to write. Yep, two stories. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut used to teach at the uh, Iowa Writers Workshop, and one of his, uh, my, my, my writing teacher learned from, from Vonnegut, um, one of his tools was he would take uh, student stories and rip off the first five pages and say, start there. Because everybody writes, beginning writers always don't don't start where the action begins. Right to get they, to a point takes yeah, forever. 
Yep, so there's that. The other thing is Hemingway. I tell all of uh, all of our young staffers to that they need to read Hemingway because Hemingway's writing is the epitome of that. It's the, it's the iceberg theory of writing that uh, that ninety percent of the story is unwritten. It's below the surface of the writing. Uh, you need to read to, between the lines to really understand what's going on in the Hemingway story. And Hemingway's quote was, "Every good writer needs an absolute." foolproof bullshit detector. Absolutely. It's more in the editing than it is the writing. Anybody can write, but if you can, can't edit, then you're not going to be clear. Much of the world needs editing, in my humble opinion. I do use the Hemingway tool because I do find that it is helpful, and it does point out like when you have sentences that are hard to read, because it is easier to write sentences that are going to be hard to read than it is to write sentences that are clear. But, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, Paragraphs with no more than three sentences, no more than like seven words in a sentence, and and subheads. You know, that's short that's, declarative sentences. Yeah, yeah, you know, in the present tense. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that does bring us to the end of the show, does it not? All right, let's oh, no, uh, wrap no, no, this bring up. Bring us to the daily numbers. The daily numbers. Got? Let's wrap this up with uh, some podcasting stats. This is from Nielsen, millennials podcast consumption. Uh, in the first quarter of 2017, millennials, uh, their definition is 18 to 34, used their smartphone to access both apps and web and the web for 78 billion minutes in the average week. That's about 1,062 minutes per millennial. Uh, for people aged 35 to 49, 73 billion minutes were spent using the smartphone in the average week. But frequency of listening to podcasts, um, 37% of millennials listen to podcasts at least once a week. Uh, compare that to 19% of those 35 and plus who listen to it at least once a week. 12% um, of uh, 35 to plus listen to it daily, or 5% listen to it daily. And 13% uh, of millennials listen to um, podcasts daily. So there you go. Well, my nephew, who is a millennial, uh, uh, told me a list of the podcasts he listens to each week, and I was quite surprised at how many there were, and also the, the high quality of them. I, I really was impressed. And he told me this at my father's 90th birthday party, and happy birthday, Dad. Mm -hmm. You wear it well. Happy birthday. <laughs> so um, we got him a hat that says, made in 19... 27. Um, no, 1917, excuse me, whatever year it was. Anyway, that brings us to the end of episode 199 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And believe it or not, next week is episode 200 of the yes. Beyond Social Media Show. Dave, we got to have a party. Um, <laughs> you know, we got to do something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> hats, confetti, maybe get Albert out here. So, um, okay, thanks for watching episode 199. And we'll come up with something special for 200. And uh, you will find links to everything we discussed and the video on beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 199. Please do leave us a review there and tell us what you think. Um, as far as where to find us, I'm BL Ackman. On Twitter, I am at what's next on what's I okay speak i blog at what's next blog.com on youtube i'm what's next blog and um i have a company called fun walkers which makes license plates for walkers and scooters and david erickson is on twitter as d erickson and he blogs in two places eStrategyblog.com and creativepr.com slash blog both of which are terrific. You should subscribe to and read them every week. And he is East Strategy uh, on YouTube. The show, BeyondSocialMediaShow.com on the web, on YouTube, Beyond Social Media Show. We're on Google+, Plus, on Twitter. We're BS Media Show. And this is important, guys. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. And we're on iHeartRadio. We would love for you to follow us on iTunes and leave us a review. That would be so helpful to us. So we will be back next week, same time, same station. And we thank you for watching tonight and see you soon. Thanks for watching.